making this activity mean so much to me. I'm incredibly grateful. Then, also, of course, my family for helping me along the way. They've always been supportive to me as well, and I also thank them. Last but not least, my partner, Yvonne, for supporting me throughout the debate. I'm incredibly proud of you. Thank you. 
Welcome to the Women's Sports Organization. Also, thanks for the financial support. That's pretty nice too. To Riley, Jason, and Ida, Maria, and Alana, and a few Queen Miss Arena from College Prep, and Joseph Bingham, and all my friends around the circuit, thank you for your companionship and camaraderie, your support and encouragement throughout the competition has been a bright spot. And to everyone from the straight team, particularly Max Mason and our Union Walker, who are here today, thank you for providing a supportive and competitive environment for me to grow. Superpowers might drive fighting parties, parties into a superficial agreement that holds 
the short run and doesn't address the core issue. Peace is crucial as Brown University cried. At least 929, 100,000 people have been killed by violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and far higher than numbers have died indirectly. Many millions have also been displaced. Thus, we negate. Down 
let's take a look at their observation. They say American diplomacy has historically failed, but their evidence is more rhetoric than it is substance. Their evidence just says we don't have forces to pull the wagons, and empirics is proof, which Schwartz explains that American diplomacy has historically pushed Iraq out of Kuwait and has brought Israel and Palestine to the table. The reason we have not been able to replicate those results is because the evidence finds after 9-11, we shifted to a military-centric approach, but the affirmative does is replicates that and shifts to diplomacy, which can solve. In addition, they've said that matters cut to the core of people's identity, i.e. the Israel-Palestine conflict. The problem is that these regional divides are inevitable. If these regional divides are inevitable, we would say having outside presence, i.e. America, in the region is substantially better because we can bring them together in spite of these divides, which is definitely a response to their regionalism arguments. Let's begin by discussing their argument on sanctions. First of all, they are getting the uniqueness picture wrong. What Tally explains is that right now, Biden is making two major reforms with regards to sanctions. First of all, he is tempering their use. There are less sanctions overall. But second, every single new sanction will have to undergo a specific review process to make sure it is only targeting the elites in power and is not targeting citizens, which is exactly what the Hernani evidence is talking about. In addition, now it is unique. What the Maui evidence finds is that because of the massive sanctions package on Moscow, which has completely failed, Biden and the entirety of Congress have recognized that big unilateral sanctions are no longer effective. So they're going to say historical precedent proves that in the status quo, we are seeing a change. In addition, their argument is based on the idea that sanctions will be the only foreign diplomacy, but we would argue this is not true. There are a lot of countries in the Middle East where sanctions have already been imposed, so we would argue the most likely form of diplomacy isn't putting more sanctions on. That's illogical. Instead, what we would do is leverage the sanctions we already have. For example, our evidence from Saful says that we could use the, the sanctions we already have on Syria and use those as leverage, bargaining their phase withdrawal in order to get concessions. That makes more logical sense because adding more of one thing doesn't do anything for you. Leveraging what you already have is effective. In addition, their argument is based on the idea that sanctions are ineffective, but their evidence here is very bad because it doesn't analyze the counterfactual. We would argue the vast majority of countries where sanctions are imposed on are already in economic crisis or have authoritarian rulers who are killing people en masse. I'll look at their specific examples. Syria had Assad, Yemen had a civil war, even Iraq had multiple coups in the span of just a few years. We would argue that all of the economic catastrophes and all the civilians that they say died likely would have died already. So the point is, what do sanctions do? What the Crane evidence finds is that sanctions raise the cost of implementing a murderous policy. Leaders know that if they do what happened in Yemen or what happened in Iraq, they will be sanctioned, which disincentivizes that, which is why we would argue in the absence of American sanctions, crises like Syria and Yemen would have been worse because leaders had, would have had more unchecked power to wreak havoc. Let's talk about their argument on wrecking regionalism. They say that right now regional cooperation is high, but they're missing the bigger picture. What the MEGC finds is that all the regional agreements that are happening right now are short term. For example, Turkey's arrangement with Gulf states. These arrangements are not designed to improve regional security in the long run. They're short term band aid solutions that don't address broader regional conflict. In addition, there are multiple empirics proving this true. For example, the Salami evidence from December 26 finds that when Iran and Saudi Arabia held negotiations, people heralded this as a new era of diplomacy, but the negotiations literally died a week afterwards, which proves that all all of these negotiations will be short term in the absence of American involvement. So let's talk about why America stalls. What the Matsuko evidence says is that in the wake of Trump leaving office, Middle Eastern countries have recognized that America is down to do effective diplomacy. So they want American involvement in their regional affairs because America can push countries through negotiations with each other. This evidence is fantastic and you should prefer it because it analyzes political shift. In addition, even if America is ineffective, they can pave the path for more effective actors. But the Pomper evidence says is that if America gets involved diplomatically, it will incentivize other actors to come into the region too. Maybe it's other regional actors like Oman who could also mediate. In the absence of American leverage, those countries will not get involved, meaning regional diplomacy will never actually occur. But lastly and most importantly, regional diplomacy cannot happen when there is instability. What the brand's evidence finds is because of the security guarantees that America provides, countries actually have to form to do regional diplomacy in the first place. That's why historically, for example, in the Persian Gulf War, where America wasn't involved, regional cooperation failed, America is necessary. Thank you,
and lastly to John, uh, because he didn't thank himself. John, uh, thank you for being an amazing partner. Uh, transitioning from LD to PF is not easy, um, and the amount of success you've achieved in your first year of debate um, at the National Circuit is incredible. Um, so thank you for sticking in with me. That said, I'll go over our case first and theirs. <coughs>
So let's talk about the regionalism argument. So you said that short-term peace is good peace. Is there any hope for long-term peace in the region, in your opinion? I think there can be, but I don't think the solution is to attempt to directly resolve the conflict on the onset. I think that incremental approaches are a far better way to address crises in West Asia. Okay, the next question. Can you give me an example of U.S. infrastructure diplomacy? Of U.S. infrastructure diplomacy? Yeah, I can build back better with an example. So just build back better mention the Middle East? No, obviously not. Like the argument we've made, right, to be very clear, is that Biden broadly has disengaged. That's an argument you make yourself. Broad disengagement means that it's unlikely that very many diplomatic actions at all in the status quo will involve the Middle East. It's a question of when we increase diplomatic actions, what does that entail? So if Biden has demonstrated an interest in infrastructure diplomacy, even if it's in other regions, that means a likely hypothetical implementation of the act would be some form of infrastructure diplomacy in addition to what everyone's talking about. Can I have a question? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. So let's talk about the observation. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Let's talk about yours. Okay. So you've made the argument that we can mitigate regional divides between nations, because, and you said that the U.S. has different threat perceptions. Yes. But how exactly do America's threat perceptions, for example, differ from countries like Saudi Arabia, right? America isn't a fan of Iran. Saudi Arabia isn't a fan of Iran. Like, how do our threat perceptions differ in a material way that would cause the regional divides that we talk about? So I think the LinkedIn evidence explains it quite nicely. The U.S. has different, like, so sure, Saudi Arabia is an example of a country that doesn't like Iran because of the ongoing war in Yemen. But when it comes to the Gulf states, which are part of the Gulf Cooperation Council and largely, they don't view Iran as a threat. They have normal relations with Iran, and the U.S. sees them directly as a threat. So the evidence says, while the U.S. defines that as a rivalry, countries in the Gulf do not define it as a rivalry too. So, so uh, that is the difference in U.S. threat perception. For quick follow up then. So does that mean your solvency excludes Saudi Arabia? Like, can not necessarily. I think if the entire Gulf wanted to push for peace, Saudi Arabia would be likely to cave. The difference is when the U.S. intervenes and tries to do diplomacy on behalf of Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states say we are no longer on board. All right, cool. Do you have a question? Talking about Syria, <coughs> can you give me an effective diplomatic action America has taken in Syria? In Syria? What do you mean by effective diplomatic action? Something we've done that's been diplomatically successful. I think the fact that we have sanctions we can leverage on them right now. So you think that, so we impose sanctions only to leverage them? Yes, that, that's the purpose of sanctions. The so how long have we had sanctions on Syria? Actually, didn't you mention like the Caesar Act was just imposed? I'm not entirely sure. The Caesar right? Act was just imposed, but we've had sanctions on Syria I'll, for about I'll be very decade. clear, right? The argument we're going to go for, or like the argument that I'm talking about here, is that America with sanctions on an active conflict has very little incentive right after it imposed sanctions to impose more of them. We have more incentive to leverage sanctions. What else do we do? All right, cool. Um, we've taken a minute 16. We'll continue that now.
Now, we're going through our argument on Syria. What we say is that Syria is a time bomb, protest, clash in Dara, and chaos in the north, but destabilize the entire region, mirroring the rise of ISIS in 2014. Luckily, US diplomatic leverage can ensure stability through raising troop withdrawal sanctions, secure negotiations from Russia and Turkey, streamlining talks, absent this, and hiding tension renewal with terrorism, doing even more wars, doing a conflict that has killed half a million people. They read three responses. The first thing is that we would just sanction them again. But no, we're going to leverage their removal. There's no reason why we would just sanction a country that has already had massive sanctions placed on them. No, our evidence says they were going to leverage the removal of those sanctions to do diplomacy, which also takes up all of their arguments about sanctions being the only form of diplomacy, because in Syria specifically, we're not going to do sanctions, we already have them. Then they say there's no plans to upgrade diplomatic relations at small scale, but there's no plans for anything in these status quo. They don't read evidence saying that we're preparing a new batch of sanctions. This obviously doesn't make sense. Then they say that historically we've attempted to create change, but it's always failed. There's so little evidence. It's analyzing a regime change type of approach. It's about drastic measures to get Assad out of power. But we're taking a honey, not vinegar approach. We are offering the diplomatic concessions in exchange for leverage from Saudi Arabia. It's not about drastic regime change. It's far simpler than that. Then here's why this here's why this argument outweighs. They have conceded the powers evidence, saying that when this war escalates, it threatens Middle Eastern stability, causes more wars from tension across the entire region, and terrorism. Besides independently outweighing on scope, it also causes the conditions for sanctions to be implemented on these countries by several foreign actors like the United States, which means it replicates all the human rights abuses that they talk about and requires the regional mediation to resolve the dispute, which links into both of their arguments. On the aid argument, on their turn, we'll agree to quote from Biden, they're never going to do it, and there's no impact. On the argument about trade-off, when our interests are when our energy interests are threatened, we come back. That's the thesis of that argument, and don't let them get any offense. Let's go on to their case. The first problem on their the first problem is that on their uh, argument that dip diplomacy also entails the military. Even if it entails military efforts, it's a question of the comparative. They have conceded all of the empirics, saying that diplomacy pushed Iraq out of Kuwait and it's brought Israel and Palestine to the table. At that point, this should frame your ballot. When all of their when all of our empirical evidence is conceded, they give zero empirical evidence of what a firm would do to these sanctions or what regional what regional mediation would be created absent United States diplomacy. You automatically pull the trigger for us. They have zero empirics whatsoever. Then let's go into the sanctions argument proper. What we say is again, more empirics. Syria had Assad, Yemen had the civil war, Iraq had coups. These are all a bunch of civilians that would have died, that likely would have died already. They're, they don't analyze the counterfactual here. There would have been other people dying. Then they have they have also agreed, they've also agreed that there's other countries that have had sanctions on, on them in the Middle East. We would just leverage the ones we already have. The argument does not apply to Syria. We can do them and other diplomacy. Then go to the regionalism. They, they have conceded the turn, saying that the United States would pave the path for more effective actors like Oman, who could also mediate without United States leverage. They're not going to get involved. They say Biden doesn't have the same threat perceptions. Well, countries like Oman that are in the region, oh, they do have the same threat perception as those countries. You prefer this turn over their argument and brings in more actors that wouldn't get involved, which impacts your more conflict.
they've dropped their military intervention term. Specifically, our Western 21 card that says when we do diplomacy, that includes military force. Every US president has done it in order to provide credibility and protection to our diplomacy. Therefore, there's not just not a trade-off between the two as Ruben suggests, but the two are interlinked and they are tied together. When you increase diplomacy, you increase military intervention in the Middle East. This is not an issue now, but they make it an issue. Therefore, when you increase diplomacy, you make conflicts like Syria worse because you put more troops on the ground, which not only don't make it better, they escalate the conflict through things like anti-American sentiment. And then second, US intervention across the regions have historically killed 8 million people, which is what they're advocating for. Now, extend our argument on sanctions. Sanctions will be the US's only form of diplomacy because they're the most politically expedient. They're the US's go-to tool in the Middle East historically, and the only form of diplomacy people have stated they would engage in. That's our Laris narrative. Syria's case in point where failure was its actions in the same direction and has caused 90% of the population to live in poverty. Overwhelming consensus indicates sanctions have killed millions more than wars and WMDs combined. 1.5 million in Iraq, for example. Sanctions also bring terrorism, bring further conflict as people become disenfranchised. So to give a few responses. First, they've dropped the support, their support, and they're talking about what the US could do, not what the US would do. You should prefer a Laris than evidence on this question because it says what the US government would do. They've also dropped that sanctions are a one-way wheel. They say we would decrease our existing sanctions. However, no. When sanctions fail, that only gives more reason to increase sanctions as seen by the Syria Act or the Caesar Act. Uh, just because a patient is on their deathbed doesn't give you the right to shoot them. Then, they've dropped our Hanania 20 card that says when we institute sanctions, they backfire every time. That's crucial because we outweigh for a few years. First, we outweigh on time frame because sanctions happen immediately and cause immediate harm. But we're a Syrian war escalating and involving all these great powers to get to their impact, take a long time, and there's no clear when it would happen. Second, we outweigh because it's the, if it's the only form of diplomacy, then they can't fall for the Syria conflict. Then, they dropped the sense that have historically killed more people than wars had over the past two decades, so on probability, you should prefer us because that's what historically killed more people. Then, onto their case proper. Actually, so on the regionalism turn, if there are different ground perceptions, the U.S. can't bring other actors to the table because it never has in the past. Then, onto their case. So, first on Syria, they've dropped, the, or they say that like, we're tied and interconnected because of energy. However, no, we are not interested in energy in the region, so we're not going to engage in the region. Then, they say that uh, it's a time bomb and they're talking about regime change. Our argument is that we would only use sanctions in Syria because that's the only way that we'll occur. Then, on like the aid argument, they can't vote for this argument, but not only that, they drop the aid worsen conflicts. That's our Wikipedia with 17 card. It says when you increase aid to this region, you worsen conflicts because the uh, like dem uh, bad regimes take the aid off the top and use it to escalate the conflict, and they use it back against their own people. Therefore, they're making this conflict worse by providing this aid. Then 
I don't understand why we shouldn't try to get out. simple. Syria is in chaos right now. We've read evidence that says the continued clashes in Dara and continued protests in northern Syria mean the country is once again turning into a time bomb. However, America can solve. Salul evidence says by leveraging the withdrawal of sanctions and the withdrawal of American forces from the area, we can change Assad's behavior. Assad's behavior is the root cause of the conflict, so if we change the behavior, that solves Syria's impact. They have conceded the power's evidence that says that Syria gets substantially worse. Instability from that conflict will spread into other conflict zones, creating more and more death. And the most important thing that has also dropped is the weighing on this argument, which is that if Syria spreads and there's more conflict across the region, that is simply further leverage for the implementation of more and more sanctions, which outweighs their argument. If there is a risk that we solve the Syrian conflict and solve all the other sanctions that they talk about, you should obviously vote for us. In addition, I would say it's more specific than their scenario. You don't know where sanctions exactly are going to be imposed, and you don't know what the world of the negative exactly looks like. But we have given a specific scenario that we can solve, which means inherently when you are writing your ballot, despite Ishan's inevitably pretty rhetoric, this is just a clearer picture, but you always default to us. At that point, their only response is saying that we aren't interested. But once again, we are not doing massive sanctions packages in the status quo. There isn't one on the floor of Congress. What our evidence says is that this is a likely diplomatic approach that we could take, which is why we will take it. They say the wheel only turns one way. But the point is that when you look at this evidence, at least the part that they sent, it doesn't mention Syria. They would like you to believe that if we redid the resolution like 15 times, it'd just be 15 additional rounds of sanctions. But their own evidence talking about coercive diplomacy didn't prove this. The point of coercive diplomacy is to leverage the coercion that you have on someone else to get some kind of results, and because we already have crippling sanctions, ask yourself, what's the most likely thing? Add another round, or use the sanctions that we already have, and use them in a positive way. The military intervention term and the aid term, neither are contextualized. The military intervention term was taken out by the comparative argument that comparatively, military intervention is worse, and the aid argument was taken out by other actors. Let's go to the sanctions argument. I'll just address the WAG. They say sanctions happen immediately, but they say time to be effective. They say sanctions kill more than war. That sanctions across the world. We would say specifically in the Middle East, they have no evidence what it looks like. You don't know what the world of the NAG looks like. You know what the world of the act looks like. So go back. Wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have killed 8 billion people, and more than that, we have implicated 
related to their Syria argument. We have said that if you increase military intervention, we can't have effective peace in Syria. We are escalating the violence. We are not allowing people to, we are worsening the humanitarian conditions on the ground and aren't changing Assad's behavior. More military diplomacy, worse than that. More than that, we have specifically outlined the military interventions kill people. They're not specifying where the conflicts start, what conflicts are a result of Syria, and as a result, military intervention is the first thing that should be on your ballot. They said that military intervention is the alternative. No, top diplomats literally cannot separate the two and only increases with diplomacy. But that said, on our argument about sanctions, a lot of their arguments center around a perfect world in which the U.S. does what's best for the citizens of the countries it is trying to afflict. But our layers of evidence is that we actually don't care about that. Instead, politicians care about what gets them votes. And as a result, we consistently impose sanctions. The wheel only goes one way. While it, not, it might, might not make sense, that doesn't mean it's not true. Our evidence says that if we were to do diplomacy, it would only be through sanctions, given that it is the most politically popular. They say that their arguments about Syria specifically. Our evidence literally mentions the Caesar Act, which was recently imposed. The Caesar Act is on Syria specifically. It says that sanctions would increase. Although, although it doesn't make logical sense in some instances, the U.S. still imposes sanctions because it's the most politically expedient and the easiest thing to do. So we would not be helping the Syrian people, and we cannot create re regime change in the first place. If we win, that sanctions occur, even if they're winning that Syria is worse, they cannot functionally access their impact because sanctions is link winning. We're saying that if sanctions occur, we cannot help Syria, we cannot benefit Syria, and more than that, sanctions have killed more people than all weapons of mass destruction and war throughout history. They are horrific and genocidal, and thus you should negate.